Has everybody gotten wealth in the man for art in Italy, 1300 to 1600 by Richard Goldthwait? Clock is ticking on that because starting on Monday, we're going to have three straight days talking about Richard Goldthwait's book because it's in three major parts, so it makes sense to spend three days on it. So if you don't have it yet, clock is ticking. Then next uh Wednesday, this Wednesday, I should say, is uh, another discussion day on Valerie Shrimplin's article on Michelangelo's Last Judgment. So we have four consecutive discussion days, back to back, back to back. But today's a very visual day. Today's uh, Michelangelo Bonoro. Uh, probably along with Leonardo, most famous artist of the Renaissance, really the first artist, capital A, in a modern sense, in a modern understanding of artists and the artist's sensibility. Giorgio Vasari, the great biographer of the artist, in 1567 wrote that Michelangelo's imagination was so perfect that not being able to express with his hands his great and terrible conceptions, he often abandoned his works and destroyed many of them. He took little sleep, but often at night he would rise to work having made himself a paper cap, in the middle of which he could fix his candle so that he could have the use of his hands. He told me that often in his youth he had slept in his clothes, too worn out with his labors to undress himself. Certainly he was sent into the world to be an example to men of art, that they should learn from his life and from his works. I count among my greatest blessings that I was born in the time when Michelangelo was alive. So says the great biographer, the artist, argued with the first art historian, Giorgio Vasari of Michelangelo. And we have the Medici family to thank because it is the grandson of Cosimo, great grandson of Giovanni de' Bici, Lorenzo de' Medici, who discovers Michelangelo because it's Lorenzo who founds the world's first art school in Florence using the statues and paintings from his personal collection. In 1488, he established the first art school in history, providing classical sculptures to study from his own precious collection. Here, he spotted a precocious young talent who was working with marble for the first time. One of this young artist's early projects was to copy the head of a fawn, an ancient satyr-like figure. And Lorenzo came to look at it, 
and said, oh, that's very good, but kind of in a joking way, said, but you know, fawns are supposed to be old men, and you've let this fellow have all of his teeth, and very few old people have all of their teeth. This young man was mortified that he'd been criticized, and he immediately knocked out one of the teeth with a chisel and had Lorenzo come back and look at it again. Michelangelo Buonarotti was only 13. Lorenzo is a connoisseur. He really knows what he's looking for. He's got a very good eye, and he sees it immediately, Michelangelo. Lorenzo takes him right under his wing, because I think he knows that this guy is fragile. He's a troubled young man, and he has to really cajole him. Lorenzo decided to bring Michelangelo into his family. The young artist was given his own rooms at the Medici Palace to grow up alongside Lorenzo's seven children. What I think is interesting is the close relationship that grew up between Lorenzo and Michelangelo. Uh, they seem to see each other almost every day, and particularly interesting is how invested Michelangelo became in Lorenzo's approval. What Lorenzo does with Michelangelo is something new. It's a very intimate relationship between patron and artist. Lorenzo would invite Michelangelo to his dinner table. Michelangelo would sit there with people like Botticelli, with Ficina, and he would listen to the sort of things they were talking about, about humanist theories, about you know, classical antiquity, and he absorbed all that, and you can see it coming out in the sculptures, and in the drawings, and in the paintings of that period of Michelangelo's life. The young Michelangelo learned his craft. His talent was pulled in two different directions. He applied himself to traditional religious subjects with great devotion. But he was increasingly drawn to the raw drama of the classical legends he heard at home. teenage years in the Medici Palace, built by Cosimo, with Lorenzo and with Lorenzo's children. It's a very, um, as, as Jerry Broughton said, a very intimate relationship that they share. And what we're going to see more of Lorenzo in the next unit when we talk about, on the one hand, his art patronage but also his really mismanagement of the family business, of the Medici Bank. And so we'll have two discussion days, one on the, the rise of the bank and then one on the decline of the bank. But it's really not in Florence that Michelangelo bursts onto the scene. It's rather down in Rome. Because in Rome, in the early 1500s, there is a powerful pontiff a warrior poet, in a very real sense, Julius II. Now, I usually say at this part that popes choose their name based upon a prior pope that they admired, and then uh, Pope Francis had to go and screw up that little vignette because there was never a Pope Francis, his name for Francis, of Assisi. That being said, in this time, Popes choose their name based on a previous pope. Now, there was a Pope Julius I. He was a, a pope way back in the early days of the church. Nothing's really known about him. Maybe didn't even exist. We don't know. The records get very spotty. Uh, 
Julius II was not an admirer of, of Julius I, early 2nd century Roman Pope. Rather, he was an admirer of Julius Caesar. And his name is an homage, not to a previous Pope, but rather to the great Roman general and uh, dictator, Julius Caesar. And Julius really kind of models himself on Caesar. In fact, in 1506, in an effort to expand the territory of the papacy, he will personally lead troops at the siege of Bologna. He is not someone to be, uh, to be trifled with. And he will build up the power of the papacy here in the early 1500s, conquering a vast state in central Italy, going all the way up to Bologna in the north and uh, down to uh, uh, south of Ostia in Latium in the south, in Lazio. But he will also be a great patron of the arts. He's a military man, but he's also a cultural giant. And Michelangelo will catch his eye. Because in 1498, one of the cardinals, one of these princes of the church, commissioned this young Michelangelo, he's in his 20s, to, uh, to carve a Madonna and child, a Pieta, a very common motif here in the late 1400s and early 1500s. Previously, as we've seen, you've taken my medieval class, representations of Jesus in the Middle Ages are very, uh, very imperial, the pantocrator, the all-conquering Jesus. But as we move through the 1400s and into the 1500s, the more common motifs for Jesus are the, the dead Jesus or the infant Jesus. And an infant painted and sculpted as an infant as opposed to just a very tiny human being, as you see in the Middle Ages. And uh, Julius is very impressed by this work. If you go to St. Peter's today, you go in the front door, you turn right, it's in the first chapel on the right. And so Julius can, uh, contracts with Michelangelo to produce his tomb. Almost like a, a, uh, an Egyptian pharaoh, Julius from the early years of his reign is plotting for his uh, immortal resting place. And he has this grand design for a tomb that's modeled on the, uh, the mausoleum of, of Halicarnassus, uh, one of the ancient wonders of the world. It's going to be this huge kind of pyramidal structure. Uh, funding, though, is, is hit and miss. And Michelangelo will actually work on this thing off and on for four decades. Its final form will not take this, uh, this three-dimensional pyramid shape, but will be more, uh, more traditional. And it's today in, uh, he's buried in uh, San Pietro in Vincoli, or St. Peter in Chains, one of the primary basilicas in the city of Rome. And this is what the, the tomb looks like. It's still very impressive with uh, the reclining uh, Romanesque figure of Pope Julius II there uh, above a huge carving of Moses. Moses becomes a very popular figure for the papacy in the 1400s and 1500s as they're attempting to rebuild their power base in the wake of the conciliar movement. Because they see in Moses a kind of dual figure, someone who had political power and the ear of God, spiritual power and political power. And so you see a lot of depictions of Moses in papal art in the late 1400s and into the 1500s. And uh, this is one of Michelangelo's early masterpieces. It really embodies his style that he will have the rest of his life of a kind of hyper-muscularity. And, as you'll notice, Moses has horns. Does anybody know why Moses has horns? Yes? Mistranslation. A mistranslation. Of what? I can't know. <laughs> um, one thing that... Uh, mm -hmm happens in the Renaissance is uh, scholars want to go back to the original text, the original languages. And the Old Testament was not originally written in Latin. What language was it written in? Hebrew. Hebrew. Aramaic, Hebrew. Uh, New Testament gets written first in Greek. But the Old Testament, where Moses appears, Hebrew, Aramaic, Semitic languages of the Near East. And 
Renaissance scholars attempt to learn these languages, but they don't do a very good job at it. And uh, in the original Hebrew, Moses is, de is described as having rays of light radiating from his head. But the, uh, the philologist mistranslated this to read horns. And so you get this whole series of depictions of Moses with horns. So nobody really stopped to think, wait, does this actually make sense? But so Moses has uh, horns there. But what I think is really interesting about this tomb are some of the pieces that he did that didn't actually make it to the finished product. Because he essentially does one side of a four-sided plan tomb. But he'd done carvings for other parts of it that he never really finishes, lays them aside. Uh, and the so-called schiavi, which is Italian for slaves, I think are really fascinating snapshots into how he worked. They were supposed to be these enslaved figures here serving as columns, not unlike the caryatids in, uh, in Athens on the Acropolis, but he doesn't finish them. And so you can see how he works a statue out of a block of marble. Um, he would probably be horrified that these survive because they're not finished. Uh, but I think they are fascinating, and you see how he really coaxes out of the marble these, uh, these figures. I like these uh, a whole lot, but he would probably be mortified and angry at me and uh, show that temper that he's famous for if he knew that uh, these were uh, museum pieces. So Julius II really patronizes in a big way Michelangelo, but it's not just in sculpture. What Michelangelo becomes most famous for is uh, something for which he thought he was very ill-equipped. And we have to go back in time to a predecessor of Michelangelo to make sense of this next great commission. This guy right here, Sixtus IV, who's Pope for a long reign between 71 and 1484. And it's Sixtus IV, or an Italian Sisto, who will build the Capella Sistina, better known as the Sistine Chapel. It serves a few purposes for this 15th century pontiff. On the one hand, it can serve as a fortress. And this is what it looked like from the outside in the 15th century before the rest of the Vatican kind of got built up around it. It uh, looks very much like a fortress. Because the papacy is, in some ways, unstable here. The Roman mob cannot necessarily be trusted, and so Sixtus <laughs> wanted a, a, a place of last resort if things really got bad, to go along with the Castel Sant'Angelo, which is far down the street from the Vatican, and you might not be able to get there when the chips are down. It also serves as an audience chain, a place for visiting dignitaries to come and meet the Pope, where he can be displayed in splendor. The walls are frescoed by some of the greatest artists of the age. Perugino, Botticelli are brought in to paint images of the life of Moses, to paint Jesus giving the keys to his disciple Simon, the whole linchpin of the papacy's argument for why they are supreme in the church. But the ceiling, when Sixtus builds his chapel, is a, is a blue star field, which is a pretty common motif here in uh, Roman churches, in the church of uh, Santa Maria Sopra Minerva. The, the ceiling is this blue field with white stars. And then you can see here along the walls, this is Jesus giving the keys to Simon, who becomes Peter. Popes will argue that Peter is the first bishop of Rome, and his power, his power over the uh, heaven and hell is, is uh, granted to all the successors of Peter. Scenes from the life of Moses. Uh, it's a chapel, and so mass can be said here, but its primary purpose really is as a place to receive and impress visiting dignitaries. But Julius II sees the ceiling as a, uh, as a canvas. 
And so it's Julius II who is uh, already contracted Michelangelo to create his tomb. He wants Michelangelo to, uh, to take on a second project, to paint the ceiling. Michelangelo had dabbled in painting here and there, but he really thought of himself as a sculptor, first and foremost. He'd never frescoed before. He'd done some oil paintings, but he didn't think of it as his thing. But the Pope is asking him here to fresco thousands and thousands and thousands of square feet of a ceiling that is about 45 feet up in the air. At first, Michelangelo thinks he's being punished. He thinks he's done something wrong. That the Pope is mad at him. And this is a, a cruel way of showing his, uh, his displeasure. But Julius II is not someone to whom you say no. And so reluctantly in 1508, age 33, Michelangelo begins work. He famously will uh, he'll bring in a couple of Florentine fresco specialists to teach him how to do it. And he employs them for about a week and then fires them. And does it all on his own. He designs the scaffolding that extends from the walls as opposed to the floor so that the chapel can still be used for its primary functions. He, uh, he paints almost the entire thing on his own. He's a perfectionist, and he doesn't want to entrust anything to a lesser hand. So I'm going to let Andrew Graham Dixon, who did that documentary you watched for extra credit, take us on a tour of uh, Michelangelo's ceiling. Michelangelo started work on the Sistine Chapel in 1508, age 32, and it took four years to complete. The work has been and truly is a beacon of our art, Vasari wrote. Sufficient to illuminate a world which, for so many hundreds of years, had remained in the state of darkness. from saying thank you to the Sistine Chapel authorities for letting me in here on my own. Normally this place is heaving. It's like a tube train. You can't think, let alone really look at the pictures. And you have such a strong sense of, of what an incredible achievement. It was, of course, Michelangelo spent years in here on his own, up there on his scaffolding, painting like that as he wrote in a poem with my head bent on my back and my paint falling on my face as if my face was a kind of floor. Now, to begin at the beginning, the different levels of the ceiling, of this wonderful ceiling, imply different degrees of closeness to God. I think the whole thing is a very kind of painted machine and you need to know how it works, you need to know how it's put together. Now, on the bottom level, Michelangelo has represented the ancestors of Christ. These are those descended from Noah who are in a kind of benighted state of waiting. They are waiting for Christ's arrival. And he's often said to be a, a painter without a sense of humour, but that's absolutely not true because here he paints them as people who are bored to death. They look like people on the tube or people in the dentist's waiting room, fearfully waiting for that moment when they say, you're next, come in. Then above them, Michelangelo suddenly turns up the spiritual volume because here you've got the figures of the prophets and of the sibyls. These are the human beings through whom God communicates his message to mankind. They are both blessed and gifted and also punished, I think, by the burdens of prophetic thought. I think Michelangelo himself felt as though he, he was a kind of prophet painting these extraordinary pictures communicating God's message to those down here looking up 
And I think he's painted them with an immense sense of fellow feeling. They are solemn, they're introverted, they're everything that we know from descriptions of him that he was. So there's a lot of projection going on there, I think. And then on the great central spine of the ceiling, he tells the story, a large story, of Genesis. It's a story that takes you from the creation of the cosmos and these three great scenes in which God separates light and darkness, creates the sun and the moon, and then calls forth life from the waters. Then, almost immediately, you're into the climactic image of this great ceiling, the image of God creating Adam. It's, kind of, it's almost like the hinge on which the whole ceiling turns. This is the moment when God, perfect God, this floating, soaring figure that hadn't been seen before in art, creates Adam. This perfect new, probably the most perfectly beautiful figure on the whole ceiling. And the two, for this one moment of perfect symmetry and perfection, they reflect each other. And you can feel that energy of creation sparked across that thin space of air that separates the two fingers. And from then on, it's really the progressive story of man's alienation from God. This is the Genesis tale, and it's a dark one. And Michelangelo tells it in a very severe way. So we move to the creation of Eve, being pulled from Adam's room, to this terrible scene of temptation and expulsion rendered two images in one. On one side, Eve and Adam fall. And Michelangelo has painted it with a daring, dark, air of sexuality, placing Eve's face threateningly close to Adam's genitalia. There's this profound, and it went back to the Middle Ages, this profound sense that the fall is not just uh, a fall into temptation, it's a fall into sexual temptation. And on the other side, Adam and Eve expelled from paradise. They leave the Garden of Eden and they enter mortal time. And you look at their faces and they They've immediately aged. Eve looks back at the self that she once was with infinite regret. And from there on, particularly if you look at the deluge, it's as if having entered the world of the fallen world of human existence, merely human existence, everything fragments and explodes. You've got the scene of the deluge where the figures are almost scattered like autumn leaves. And then the final image is this, this depiction of the drunkenness of Noah, an old man drunk, alone in his tent, discovered by his three sons, an image of fallen humanity. What a contrast to that image of God at the other end, separating light from darkness. It's a bleak and severe and ascetic telling of the tale of human history, and it's got a huge, solemn grandeur to it. Michelangelo may have used the occasional assistant to paint the occasional tiny bit of the ceiling, but basically it was all his own work. And when you stand here in this great space and you look up at that vast amount of painted ceiling with its extraordinary multiplicity of compositions and forms and faces and emotions and ideas, it's almost unbelievable that something well, that amazing could have been created by one human being. So no wonder Giorgio Vasari, in his life of Michelangelo, says that he wasn't actually a man at all. He was an angel. He was a being sent down by God to show the rest of us artists how it's done.
Um, Andrew Graham Dixon had a nice little experience there to be uh, in the Sistine Chapel when it's not full of people. Um, you know, I had a Fulbright Fellowship over in Italy with my dissertation research, and we started off in Rome, and they, we got a private tour of the Sistine Chapel after hours, and they turned the lights on, and I said, you can take pictures, take pictures. Uh, it was pretty fantastic. When you're there as a civilian, it kind of sucks. It's very, so crowded. And the, uh, the docents there, the people who work there, are jerks. Um, jealously guard the, uh, the photography rights because, of course, they want to sell you postcards in the gift shop. Um, so it's a very complicated schematic, operating really on three levels, as, as Graham Dixon said. In these triangular areas are the, uh, the pre-Christians who are anticipating the coming of Jesus. And then you have, in these spots here, both Old Testament prophets, but also uh, 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 pagan oracles like Delphi and uh, the Erythraean and, and Cumaean uh, oracles. It's kind of an interesting mix of a pagan and uh, uh, a Christian, pre-Christian really, motifs. So let's start with the, uh, the middle of the wall here. Middle of the ceiling, I should say. Along the spine is uh, the story of the beginnings of humanity and the beginnings of the world. And so you have the separation of light and darkness, the creation of the sun and the moon, the, uh, the creation of life, of the oceans, and then in the central frame, the, uh, the creation of Adam. And uh, Paul Borolsky, who's an art historian uh, at UVA, he might be retired now, has argued that this scene represents the moment just prior to Adam getting his soul. That he's just a lump of clay here. Which is why he seems very nonplussed by the presence of God and his assembled uh, angels here. Because he's not really alive yet. He hasn't been touched by God. And so that tiny little space is the difference between a lump of clay and uh, an insoled human being. Now, recently, some, uh, some art historians have argued rather controversially that this image here of God with his angels, if we go back one, see it a little more clearly there is uh, a picture of a brain. God's in our head. Now, we don't know that Michelangelo ever did any dissections. We know Leonardo did. We know he did lots. At this very moment, he's doing lots of dissections. So, is it a brain? I don't know. It's an interesting theory. It could just be a coincidence. But uh, that's, that theory has popped up in the last few years. The creation of man is followed by one interpretation of the creation of, of Eve. There are actually two creations in the book of Genesis. In chapter 1, it says God creates man and woman. And then in chapter 2, the, interpret, the version that Michelangelo has chosen to use, uh, God creates Eve from one of Adam's ribs while he is put into a, a deep sleep. This, uh, in most theologians' eyes, was where things went wrong. This is a very misogynistic culture, a very patriarchal culture, and one in which women are blamed for a lot of society's ills, especially temptation. And so in his depiction of the fall. I think Andrew Graham Dixon is, is spot on in arguing that there is a there's an overt sexuality to this. That women are the undoing of men. And specifically blonde women. Now it doesn't look that blonde here, but uh, 
This is actually the serpent depicted as half snake, half blonde woman. Uh, in Renaissance Italy, blonde hair was regarded as a, a kind of marker, a potential marker, not in every case, of uh, loose morals. And so Michelangelo, who didn't have a great relationship with women, didn't trust them, and uh, may have been a homosexual, unclear, uh, depicts the serpent as a woman, as a blonde woman. An interesting uh, psychoanalyst would have a, a, a nice long talk with Michelangelo about this frame here, but this is really at the center of the ceiling. Because for the 16th century mind, this is the point where it went off the rails. <coughs> Humanity has been paying the price for this mistake ever since. This is original sin, capital O, capital S. And it doesn't get any better for humanity. Michelangelo <laughs> continues the depressing story with the, uh, the story of Noah and God's decision to destroy the world. This is actually my favorite uh, frame from the ceiling. It's definitely in a minor key, but uh, the pathos and the emotion in these figures is uh, really Michelangelo at his finest. Keep in mind, he's really never painted before in any meaningful way. He's kind of getting his sea legs here, but he does a hell of a job at it. So let's look at this in detail. On the left side, you have this triangular set of people trying to struggle onto the land, what's left of it, carrying their possessions. This woman with a small table on her head, and you can see her worldly possessions there. I like this face especially, uh, looking back in, uh, in disbelief that it's all come to an end. And then this raft here, where the barbarity of humanity comes to the fore, because this guy's just trying to get into the raft, and he's being grabbed by the back of the neck, arm raised to punch him, and this person has a club. So, come hell or high water, no pun intended, that guy is not getting in the raft. Um, and then up here, uh, the ark itself, with uh, people desperately trying to get on board, but uh, the passengers having none of that. This guy has an axe with which he's going to take a swing at this guy. Um, Everyone's also basically naked. Um, Michelangelo, as we're going to see in a lot of his paintings and his sculptures, uh, doesn't like clothing. I think part of that is the argument that things are being seen almost from God's eyes. And God sees you as he created you. And so very few people have clothing, or they have a scarf, which doesn't seem like it would be doing a lot of good. These people are desperately trying to get on the ark, and there's Noah in the window, and there's the dove that he will eventually release and will come back with the olive branch, symbolizing the end of this deluge. Then on the right side of the frame is, a, is another island, a much smaller, just little crag of land onto which people are, are trying to make their way. This person has brought a, uh, a barrel, which is presumably a barrel of wine, because you, know, you got to save what's important. And then this really touching image of an old man carrying what I presume to be his son onto this island. And they've made a little makeshift lean-to here to protect them from the elements. So here's the entire scene again. It's very, very dark. It really shows the... Uh, Humanity's ugly side, especially in the uh, the inhumanity here and and here. And then the last frame on the center spine is uh, is a rather obscure story from the book of Genesis. It takes place after the end of the deluge, after the flood, and it's the uh, the drunkenness of Noah. 
here is Noah cultivating wine, uh, vines, and that those vines lead to this vat of wine, and this vat of wine leads to drunk Noah. And, and interestingly, he's shown the passage of time here, because notice he has a very short beard here, but by the time the vines actually grow and he makes the wine and it ferments, he's got a, a long beard. So he's a patient man. And um, this comes from Book of Genesis, uh, chapter, uh, where is it? chapter 9. And Noah planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine, and was drunken. And he was uncovered within his tent. Uh, the Old Testament is, is obsessed with nakedness, and uh, you shall not see the nakedness of fill in the blank. It's, uh, it's an obsession of the Old Testament. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment, and laid it upon both their shoulders, and went backwards, and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. The Old Testament also likes to repeat things. And Noah awoke from his wine, and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, shall he be unto his brethren. Now, this story is interpreted by later theologians to be the, the genesis of Asia, Africa, and Europe. Africa is the descendants of Ham. Europe are the descendants of Japheth, and Asia are the descendants of Shem. And in the 16th, well, 15th, 16th, 17th, right up to the 19th century, proponents of slavery, West African slavery, will point to this and say, God said Africans should be slaves. A servant of servants shall he be unto the brethren. Right up until the Civil War, you can see Southern uh, uh, pro-slavery advocates referencing Genesis chapter 9 as a uh, justification for the enslavement of West Africans. So that's the uh, center spine from beginning of Genesis through to the drunkenness of Noah. But it's not the whole ceiling. There are these, uh, these side images. And I want to look particularly at the, the images between the creation and these predecessors, that is to say, these oracles. This is a, a mixture of Old Testament prophets and Greco-Roman pagan oracles, seers of the future. And so you have Isaiah here, but then you have Delphica, or the Delphic oracle, here. You have Joel, Old Testament prophet here, and Erythrea, the Erythraean Sibyl, here looking at her book of the future, looking at her scroll telling the future. And so it's an interesting mixture. What the theologian would say is that all of these pre-Christian pagan oracles had predicted the coming of Jesus. It's also a reflection of, of this time period that the 1400s saw an explosion of interest in Greek and Roman mythology, in writing, in literature, in epic poetry. And so you see this kind of weird, seemingly paradoxical mixture of these pagan oracles and these Old Testament prophets here on the ceiling. So let's look back at the schematic. Before we leave the, uh, the chapel here, I want to point out two interesting images right here along the entrance wall. David and Goliath and Judith and Holofernes. It's two Old Testament stories. David, the slayer of the Philistine giant Goliath and future king of Israel, and Judith, the, uh, the seducer and beheader 
of the Assyrian general Holofernes. This is the David, and this is Judith and her assistant carrying away the decapitated head of this giant Assyrian general, Holofernes. Now when we get to the next unit, to the Medici unit, uh, we're going to have a discussion day using Sarah McCam's article about Donatello's uh, bronze sculptures of these two events, the David and Judith, which stand in the Medici Palace in Florence. And there's a lot of veil, a lot of levels of meaning to these, uh, these two statues. So I just wanted to give you a little preview of a discussion we're going to have after the next exam, after the Medici lecture, the Sarah McCann article on Donatello's David and Donatello's Judith. Finally here, just as we saw with uh, the Last Supper, with Leonardo's Last Supper, by the late 20th century, this fresco was in trouble. It is a fresco. It is not oil paint on the wall, which means you can clean it because the paint is in the plaster. And between 1979 and 1999, a huge cleaning operation took place. And they stripped away a layer of varnish. It really darkened the paintings. This is a picture from before 1979. This is after 1979. Everything got much, much brighter and more pastel in, uh, in appearance. Some people said that this was a travesty. They derided it as a Benetton Michelangelo, that he had not intended for these colors to be so bright, so vivid, that he had put the varnish on there as a way to dull the images. Some people would argue, no, in fact, that varnish was added later as a protective measure, and the varnish had absorbed smoke from the hundreds of years of candles that had been burned in this chapel, and it become so dirty that it had to be removed. Generally speaking now, most people are very happy with the result, and uh, it has, uh, I think, greatly improved the, uh, the look of the chapel. Here's what it looked like before 79, and here is after 79. The colors are more vibrant, they're brighter. I believe that this is what he intended it to look like. And it looks closer now to uh, the original than it did before 1979. Still some people got their, their noses out of joint about this, but uh, I think it was a, a great project, a very expensive project, very, very long project. Because to clean uh, a fresco like this, you can really just use water. And you get very, very soft toothbrushes, and you very, very slowly, square inch by square inch, clean this massive ceiling. Long project, that's why it took 20 years. So where the Last Supper was restored by repainting, this is uh, more of a cleaning. Also took 20 years. Very deliberate project. Now you notice in this left side picture, these are not actually from the same direction. This is the entrance wall, and this is the altar wall. And Michelangelo also painted it. It's a last judgment. Painted at the behest of this guy right here, Pope Clement VII. Michelangelo grew up with this guy because this is Lorenzo de' Medici's nephew who lived in the Medici Palace. So they knew each other as teenagers. And after Michelangelo finished the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in 1512, he declared that he was never painting anything like this again. Uh, he was going back to sculpture, that he was a sculptor first and foremost. He's not a painter. But in 1533... Pope Clement, childhood friend of Michelangelo, convinces him to pick up the brush again and to paint a last judgment, an apocalypse, in an unusual place on the altar wall, on the east wall. Generally, these are painted on the, uh, on the west wall, on the wall that you see when you walk out. This is the case in the Scrovania Chapel. But this is on the altar wall. 
And the Pope wants him to do this because the church is in chaos. Sixteen years earlier, Martin Luther had launched his challenge against the papacy in the Catholic Church, and Clement was an embattled pontiff. So let's take a look at the full wall here. It's his last great painting. It is an enormous space. And it features Jesus, the saved to his right, the damned to his left. Now you'll notice the background is this deep blue. It's ultramarine. When he painted the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, he had to buy his paints ahead of time and then got reimbursed. Or he hoped he would get reimbursed by the notoriously cheap Julius II. To do this project, he negotiated a good contract. He said, you're, okay, you're going to buy all my paints ahead of time. You're going to pay me ahead of time. And these are the only ways in which I'll take on this project. And so in order to kind of, I think, stick it to the Pope, he uh, decides to paint this fast background in very, very expensive ultramarine. Because it's not out of his pocket. So let's take this part by part. Let's look at the first, the top half. <clears throat> you have an unbearded, very Apollonian Jesus, looking very much like the, the, the Greek and Roman god Apollo, with a sun behind him, referencing again Apollo. Very typically hyper-muscular. Michelangelo's figures are, are very thick. And... Um, when he originally painted this, everyone was naked. No one had even these uh, cloths draped like this. It was a bit scandalous. Some of the cardinals said this was uh, this was um, this was salacious. This was profane to be in the Sistine Chapel with all these naked images. And so they got a an artist after Michelangelo died to come in and paint these modesty uh, claws. There's one there, there, uh, and, and different places in the painting. And uh, the, uh, the artistic community was horrified that one of their fellow artists had agreed to do this. And so they gave him a nickname which uh, translates into English as the underwear man. And uh, kind of blackballed him from their community. So you have a, an unusual depiction of Jesus as a kind of godlike Apollo. And you have a very frightened heavenly host here. You see Mary turning away. Here's Peter. We know it's Peter because he's holding two keys, seemingly imploring Jesus to uh, consider what he's about to do. This guy's hands are up. Everyone is a little freaked out by what is about to happen here. Unsettled, 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 unsettled. This, I like this guy right here with this. <laughs> this is something I did. Jesus, calm down. Do you really want to do this? And I think this reflects Michelangelo's thought process at the time. He saw in Martin Luther's critique a lot of validity. He recognized, after spending all this time in the Vatican, that the papacy was corrupt. Especially the papacy of Leo X, whom he grew up with because he is a Medici. Leo X is Giovanni de' Medici. He reigns from 1513 to 1521. So right in the heart of Martin Luther's revolt. And Clement VII, he's Giulio de' Medici, Lorenzo de' Medici's nephew, the son of his brother, and he is Giovanni. And these guys grew up in the same house. Michelangelo recognized the basic moral bankruptcy of these popes, and the arguments that Luther is making, that to buy forgiveness, buy an indulgence, 
is a uh, is a perversion of Jesus' message. But he also is a loyalist. And so, in his mind, he will be torn. On the one hand, he doesn't want to see the church split in two. He wants to remain loyal to the popes. But he also sees in the popes massive corruption and a broken system. And so... He never becomes Protestant, but he flirts with some of the Protestant critiques. And I believe that this last judgment is a damnation on both sides. A, a kind of statement that when Jesus comes, you all are screwed. Both sides of this confessional divide. Some people have argued this is a self-portrait right here. That this is uh, St. Bartholomew, who is famously flayed alive. And all these saints here are holding the instruments of their execution. And so he's holding a knife, and there's his skin that I guess he carries around with him. And some people have said, this is Michelangelo's face. Right there. So that's the top half. The bottom half is where the rubber meets the road. To Jesus' right side, stage left. The saved, to his left, stage right, the damned. So let's start with the uh, the quick, with the saved. It's a, it's a uh, a violent resurrection. People are being dragged out of their tombs. This person by their legs. Um, the whole scene is one of chaos and violence. Even if you're on the right side of the equation, this is not going to be a pleasant experience. And if you're on his left side, you're going down into hell. But it's a different kind of uh, hell. Let's, uh, let's focus on this side first. Unease. 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 These people aren't celebrating the end of the world. Everyone, if Mary and Peter are scared up in heaven, these people are petrified, being ripped out of their tombs. And here are the angels of the apocalypse opening the seven seals. On the right side, it's not punishment that awaits these people. It's much more psychological than that. And art historians have argued that this guy right here, especially is emblematic of what awaits these people. This is Giotto's hell in his last judgment. People are being physically punished for what they've done. Art historians have argued that Michelangelo is depicting a kind of psychological punishment. That the people descending into hell here are going to be punished by being without God. And that this guy right here shows this, this kind of grief, this realization at what is in store. It's not going to be hung by your penis or your tongue. It's going to be something more uh, internalized, an absence of God as people are being shoved, again, brutally, just as the, the saved are being shoved up to heaven, the damned are being brutally shoved down to heaven. This angel is raining blows down on this guy's head here. So, on, uh, on Wednesday, we have a discussion day. Valerie Shremplin's 1994 article about this single fresco. <coughs> it's an interesting piece. It's got some good visuals in it. There's Joko's Last Judgment and there's Michelangelo's. <coughs> Michelangelo spends most of his time in Rome. He's in Florence very little. And his last great project is an architectural project. Pope Julius II had big plans for the papacy. He had military plans for the conquest of territory in central Italy. He had artistic plans for the decoration of the Sistine Chapel. But he also had architectural plans. This is what St. Peter's looks like at the beginning of the 1500s. The original basilica right here, built by whom? 
Constantine, very good. After his conversion to Christianity, it's a very traditional Roman basilica. And by the year 1500, it's 1,200 years old. It's getting a little long in the tooth. And Julius II wants to build a new church, a church fitting of the power of the papacy. So he brings in a Florentine architect, this guy right here, Donato Bramante, who had really never had any big commissions. His biggest commission was this tiny little cylindrical chapel in Rome built in 1502 called the Tempieto, which literally means the little temple. But Julius likes what he sees in this, uh, and he brings in Donato for the commission of his life. And so Donato designs a radical departure for the church. We're going to tear the old church down, and we're going to build something modern in its place. Instead of the traditional lengthwise basilica, we're going to build a symmetrical center plan church surmounted by an enormous dome. It's going to be very Greco-Roman. Notice these triangular porticos here, columns. We're going to build something that looks like the Romans would have built it because that is, of course, the ultimate goal of art and architecture here in this time period, be it Brunelleschi before this or Andrea Palladio after this. And so construction begins. The original church is torn down. A very small little temporary structure is built over St. Peter's tomb. And some people have argued that Raphael's so-called School of Athens, painted at the time this is being done, is uh, the background is St. Peter's in construction process with it open to the air, but some of the vaults already built. I actually think it's probably true. The problem is money. Money is always a problem. This is a horribly expensive project. And work lags. Work stagnates, in fact. The original church is gone. Part of a new church is built. But most of it's not. And so in 1547, Pope Paul III calls on Michelangelo. He'd done other architectural projects in the city of Rome. He really could turn his hand to anything and do it better than anybody else, be it painting, be it sculpture, be it architecture. Paul III turns to Michelangelo. He's, uh, he's now uh, almost 75 years old. He's in retirement. He says, you have to come and save this project. So Michelangelo reluctantly agrees probably uh, very in his crabby manner. And uh, he comes in and makes some minor changes to Bramante's plan. He, uh, he adds some elaborations. He smooths off some edges, making more of an octagon than a square. And he adds a very Roman portico to the front, kind of like the Pantheon has. But basically keeps the same shape. And this is a side elevation. It's going to have an enormous dome, about the size of the dome on Santa Maria del Fiore in, uh, in Florence, the Duomo. But it's going to be a very symmetrical building, where the dome is the central feature, visible from any part of the city. The problem is Michelangelo dies before it's finished. And the religious sensibilities have changed. And a new architect is brought in, in 1603, a guy named Carlo Maderno. The Catholic Church in the late 1500s becomes very conservative. In the face of the Protestant challenge, the Catholic Church doubles down on the old ways. And Michelangelo and Donato Bramante's design is very novel. It's a little too cutting edge for what is becoming a very conservative Catholic church. And so changes are made to the original plan. This nave is added, this long horizontal hall, turning it into a more traditional shape. The traditional basilica with the transept 
and the nave forming a cross. So instead of Michelangelo's more symmetrical Greco-Roman design, Carlo Maderno makes it more traditional. Fits in with the religious sensibilities of the Catholic Church here in the late 1500s. Now if we look at a satellite photograph, this is what the church looks like today. Michelangelo's church would have looked been about this. It would have been very symmetrical. The dome would have dominated with a small Pantheon-esque portico on the front, but that's not what happened. And Moderno, because of this huge extension of the nave and the construction of this massive heavy facade, screws up all the sight lines. If you're standing in St. Peter's Square, you can barely see the dome. It was supposed to be the focus, the epitome. But Moderno dorked it. He built this big, rather lumpy, unelegant facade, and when combined with his nave extension, messed up the sight lines of the whole place. The dome should have been as designed by Bramante and Michelangelo, the pinnacle. It's a big dome. It's a very big dome. It is about the size of Brunelleschi's dome, built over a century earlier. It's about 140 feet wide. It's wider than the Pantheon, but much, much taller, like, uh, like Brunelleschi's dome. And uh, here's what it looks like from the tomb of St. Peter. The entire church is richly decorated in the Baroque style. There's no square inch that's not somehow decorated or gilded. And you can go up in this dome, just as you can go up in Brunelleschi's dome. First you take an elevator up to this ring right here, and you can walk around this ring. And this is the view from up there. It's quite, quite high. Those are little tiny people down there. Uh, I have a fear of heights and went up there and, and clung to the walls. And uh, it's miserable. Uh, but then you have to take stairs because there's no elevator from this level to the top. And just as is the case in Brunelleschi's dome, it's a double dome. Because Michelangelo used Brunelleschi's design because it worked double dome with an interior and an exterior dome and you spiral very, very slowly up and as the sign says, please keep in mind for the old, the suffering and the cardiopathic people as to go up to the dome, there are 320 steps besides the lift. A nice bit of a terrible English translation uh, in Italy. And if you get to the top, 320 steps, unless you're a cardiopathic person, <laughs> or suffering or old, then uh, you get a hell of a view of the city. It's the highest point in Rome. It's 40 plus stories up in the air, and it is finished in the year that Michelangelo died. The, uh, the piazza here is built in the mid and late 1600s by Bernini, these great arm like porticos. And then this avenue right here is built by Mussolini after his, uh, his uh, concordat with the church in the 1920s. So uh, if you go there, do go up in the dome. It costs a few bucks. It's free to get into St. Peter's, uh, but I think to go up is hey, four or five bucks. It's worth it, but if you're cardiopathic, uh, you could be in trouble because there are 320 steps. So, uh, take some time now with your partner to do some review. What do you have in your notes for the Pieta, for the tomb, for the Sistine Chapel, etc., etc., etc.? Thank you.
Well, it's a tough day. I'm still writing. I'm still writing. Yeah. It's just cold. I've had them before. questions we're going to come back to Michelangelo when we get to uh, the next unit because of course the thing that's not in this list is maybe his most famous sculpture the 13 foot tall David but that doesn't quite fit into the story yet so that's going to reappear when we get to the uh, the next unit so no questions no okay so discussion Tomorrow, not tomorrow, Wednesday, sorry, uh, Valerie Shrimplin's 1994 article about this fresco here, and especially about what's going on at the very bottom. Uh, it's the first of four discussions in a row, and uh, then we'll have our exam review and our exam. So if you haven't gotten uh, Goldthwait's book yet, time is ticking on that, because on Monday we'll be discussing part one. A week from Wednesday, section two, and then two weeks from today, section three. So do get that. It is in the bookstore. You can probably get it much cheaper online, but that shit may have sailed at this point.